Please turn your Bibles and find Mark chapter 12, verses 35 to 37, where we'll turn our attention this morning. If you recall, last week was an impressive display of Jesus' authority. Jesus took a very common question in his day and gave a very common answer to a common question. Remember, the scribe came up to him and said, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus gave a common answer, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. But as we discovered, the authority that came from Jesus came in his judgment upon the man who answered even correctly. This man clarifies, if you'll remember. He clarifies Jesus' answer. He says, yeah, it's even better to do that than to all the sacrifices. After Jesus heard the scribe's clarification, his agreement with his own words, there on the temple mount, thousands of people hanging on every word between these two, Jesus looked to the scribe who claimed to explain God's word to God's people. Jesus looked to the scribe who claimed to be the representation of godliness amongst God's people. Jesus looked to him and he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus said to this man, and he said to us, that a life of good works, a life of good knowledge, a life of showing others good things, it can't save you. Why? Because you're a sinner in need of God's grace and mercy, not in need of a better plan or a better strategy. And so Jesus judged this man as inadequate for the kingdom. Jesus judged this man as outside of the kingdom. Was he close? Yeah, he was close. I mean, imagine this. If you're six foot six and you stand heel to heel with me, which one's closer to the moon? You are. But who cares? Close ain't going to get you there and you can't do it on your own. This man was outside the kingdom. The judgment of this man shocked everyone. It shocked them. It shocked them so much that they do something that we rarely see the religious elite do in Mark's gospel. It Shut them up. They, they had nothing more to say. Mark chapter 12, verse 34, look at the end of it. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Jesus taught, Jesus preached, Jesus interpreted God's word with such authority and with such conviction that no one any longer had anything left to say to him where they thought they could gain an advantage on him. They were reminded that Jesus was on a completely different level, a level all of his own. He was like them, but not. He, he, his understanding of the law was like theirs, but not theirs. Jesus was always the final authority on every matter. They could never find a chink in his armor. His character could not be stained. His godliness could not be muted. His perfection could not be denied. He was other. He was perfect. He was set apart. He was different from all the religious leaders all around Israel, and they all started to understand it. My question for you is how do you view him? Are you like maybe some of the religious leaders that view him as different, view him as separate, view him as maybe even above and beyond your ability, maybe even as somebody you don't want to mess with? Well, that's not good enough. That's Jesus' point today. Do you view him as set apart from man, as not a normal man? That's good. That's a start, but that gets you not far from the kingdom. Until you view him as the holy man among men, the holy divine man among mankind, the holy God-man, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the perfect Christ, co-equal with the Father, co-equal with the Son, with the Spirit, you don't understand the man Jesus Christ. As we study and worship Christ, do we remember he's the God-man? Do we remember he's the long-awaited lamb, the Messiah, the, as we sang, the lamb of God and the lion of Judah, the one who came to die to take away the sins of the world and the one for whom we long and wait for eagerly, the one who will set in motion the final eschaton at his return, he'll he'll descend from heaven and rule perfectly for a thousand years with a saved Israel. He'll save us from the wrath to come. God's promises made complete. 
Jesus, the Savior, the Christ, the anointed Messiah, the King, once all of his work is done, will recreate the new heavens and the, the new earth, bringing to all of his own, those whom he died for, those whom he gave life to through faith in himself, will bring the peace and the perfection and the glory of the Garden of Eden to the new Garden of Eden. We'll have all that man had before the fall, perfect for eternity. That's, that's Jesus. Sometimes we just kind of put Jesus in a box as a man who lived a long time ago and did a lot of really good things. Don't forget who you're dealing with when you study Jesus. He's not some mamby-pamby, teased-haired, airbrushed-on-velvet theologian. He's the God-man. He's the king. That was the lesson that we have to hope some of these people here in Mark chapter 12 on the Temple Mount on Wednesday of the Passion Week learned. Because through the questions of the crowd, Jesus put on, his, put on display his messiahship. And yet the crowd, they missed it. Not just a few of them, not just most of them, but nearly all of them missed who Jesus was. Many consider these questions in Mark's gospel uh, in his mind as a tool to help us understand the relationship between Jesus' work and how the Passover functioned. In Jewish tradition, grandfathers or the oldest patriarch of a family, uh, they would sit down with their family on one of the evenings of Passover. They kind of gather them all around and they would, they would allow a question and answer time. The, the people would ask questions of the patriarch, uh, questions about the laws, about Torah. They would ask questions about how Israel was supposed to relate with the surrounding Gentile nations. They'd, they'd ask questions uh, about God's authority in the daily elements of their life. They'd ask questions, difficult passage questions. Questions. What does that sound like? It should sound like the last few times we studied Mark's gospel. That's what the people of Israel were doing to the patriarch of Israel, the true king, Jesus, though they failed to understand exactly who he was. And Jesus will answer all of these questions about Passover ultimately with the final answer to everything that Passover was designed to explain. Jesus will end Passover with his own death. Remember, the Passover began in Egypt with Israel enslaved and in bondage to the Egyptians. The Passover is completed in, in, in Egypt's time with Israel having the exodus through the Passover leaving being set free from her bondage to Egypt. The Passover in Jesus' day, the ultimate Passover, completes on Calvary. When Jesus dies for the sins of the world, all those who would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing in him they'd have life in his name, their Passover is complete. They're set free. They're redeemed from bondage to sin and evil. For thousands of years, Israel longed for this moment to meet her Messiah, to find him that would lead them to freedom. And here he is. Here he is right in front of them. It seems like she forgets who she's talking to. Four questions she asks him on the Temple Mount on this talkative Wednesday of Passion Week, and they all prove the inadequate, man-centered view of religious people, really the damning consequences of those man-centered views. All the religious leaders accomplish in their questions and their attacks on Jesus is to make themselves look like fools and make Jesus look like the true king that he was. And up to this point, they just asked Jesus questions and Jesus answered. But now Jesus has had enough. He'll again make clear to those, who's, those who are his exactly who he is. My friends, for us, we have to be careful with who we're dealing with. Jesus turns the tables on the religious and he goes on the offensive. He, he takes the initiative now to ask them the questions, a question that gets to the heart of exactly and truly who Jesus is. So stand with me as we study to worship our king and we read Mark chapter 12, verses 35 to 37. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can these scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. 
David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning and need your Spirit's help to understand the truths that we see in this passage, the truths that are so vital to our salvation, the realities of who our Savior is. Father, help us not just to study now, but to worship. Pray that your word would be made clear by your Spirit, that the truth of our King would be made evident, that our lives would be able to worship more fully who we know more completely. Father, we need your help And so we ask in our Savior's name, amen. You can be seated. Today we learn from Jesus, in the silence of the crowd, three grounds for worshiping Christ as our worthy king. Notice again in verse 35, we're going to see the humanity of Jesus on display the humanity of Jesus on display. The religious elite ask four questions in Mark's gospel. This is the fifth question, and Jesus asks it. You can kind of imagine Jesus like, okay, I've answered. Now now listen, this is, this is your turn. Jesus kind of, it's like, a, like an amazing boxer. He pushed them in the corner. He was skillful. He deflected their jabs. He ducked their haymakers. And if ever there were a time that the religious elite needed to grab control of this whole situation, this was it. And what do you see? They completely don't even know what to say. They're dumbfounded. And so Jesus takes them on. Everything for them was on the line. They wanted Jesus dead. They were losing control of Israel. They were going to lose control to the degree that the Roman occupation would say, hey, you're done. We're now in control. You've got nothing. Just back off Sanhedrin. We'll take care of this. Jesus was putting their livelihoods in peril. Everything was on the line, but Jesus was in control of the fight. He had shut their mouths. He had exhausted their mental abilities, and he wasn't even winded. It's like one of those joggers that just keeps jogging with a smile on their face. I don't understand those people. They just keep going. Jesus, he never even slowed down. He didn't didn't need a break from this. He he could do this all day, and these, these religious elite were done. He was exercising his authority over them in a way that they couldn't combat. There they were in front of this vast crowd of people. I mean, it would have been wall to wall in the Temple Mount, heel to toe. People would have been stuffed together trying to get a glimpse of Jesus, to hear what Jesus was going to say, uh, to see the reaction of the Pharisees. This was the best show in town. People were excited. People were angry. Some people wanted him dead. Other Maybe a few wanted to worship him. You've probably never seen anything like this. It would have just made the hair on the back of your neck stand on end. It would have made your tongue bitter as all that adrenaline was coursing through your veins as you watched this life or death scene unfold in front of your eyes. You knew these most powerful men wanted Jesus dead. And here he was on their home court shellacking them. He dismantled, nearly dismembered their theological arguments. They were done, and Jesus has just begun. Jesus is about to turn them inside out. And he begins with a question that's kind of strange because they both agreed on the same answer. Verse 35, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? My guess, if you just put a little theological imagination into it, Jesus is like, how can the scribes, them over there in their Dolce and Gabbana robes, how can they say that the Christ is the son of David. How can they say these things? Remember the grammar guys, the Grandma Chews, that was their name. They, were the, they had the keys of the kingdom. They were the high and mighty, the big guys, the fat camels of Israel. How can they say the Christ is the son of David? And you can imagine the people thinking, well, wait a minute, I thought you said the Christ was the son of David. Jesus is being just a touch cagey here, as he often is. Because everybody who was anybody in Jesus' day believed that the Christ was the son of David. They would have agreed on this. And notice carefully, Jesus is not disagreeing with verse 35. He's just introducing his topic. He's saying, look, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who's going to come, the promised king of the Old Testament, he 
will be the son of David. He will be in the lineage of David. These two people are not two people. They're one. They're the same person. The promised anointed one will be the Messiah who delivers his people. He'll be on the throne of David. He'll be from the line. Same person. Isaiah chapter 9. It told him this very clearly. Speaking of the Messiah, it said, He will reign on David's throne. Also, Jeremiah 23 tells us David's offspring will reign as the ultimate king. 2 Samuel chapter 7, what we'll read next week in our scripture reading, God will make David's throne uh, and God will raise up kings on David's throne. This, This is the key. Listen to this. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 13. God will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. That's the promise that God gives David. The Davidic throne has God's eternal stamp of approval and seal on it. This, this is incredible. I, uh, Psalm chapter 89, verse 3 and 4. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring and build your throne for all generations. I mean, you talk about the hope of Israel as a nation, this is it. The Davidic throne. When uh, the king sits on the throne and he's he's in the line of David, then all things in Israel are going to be good. That's their mindset, and that's exactly what Jesus is playing on. God, by grace, made David's throne eternal. You can look at that in Micah chapter 5, it's all about that. Amos chapter 9, it's all about that. Much of Israel's hope for the future was set on the eternal Davidic throne throne. They point to this as being their hope. And Jesus says, yeah, good. We're on the same page with that. But what does this teach us about the Messiah? Well, if he's from the throne or the line of David, what must he be? Don't think too hard. He must be human. He must be man. This wasn't a debate in Jesus's day, but it's been a debate throughout church history. Was the Messiah really human? Or was it just God acting upon or animating uh, a man to do his bidding, like a divine robot of sorts? Surely, God didn't take on actual humanity. Like many heresies, it probably began with a a good motivation, uh, the elevation of God and his divinity. Surely, God didn't really take on human flesh. Surely something else must have been the case. Friend, let me assure you that if God, if the Messiah was not human, then you don't have salvation. If the Messiah was not truly man, you don't truly have salvation. The humanity of Jesus is absolutely necessary to the salvation of his people. For many people, Jesus is like a a theological superman. He gets put into a capsule and he gets launched to earth and he shows up in a backwater town, not Hutchinson, but Bethlehem. You know, just here he comes. There's Jesus. That's, That's not it. Jesus was human. Jesus was truly human. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, we get some help to understand this. The context of Hebrews chapter 2 reminds us that Jesus suffered and Jesus died so that by the grace of God, he may taste death for everyone. So there's the context. We're talking about salvation, Jesus' role in salvation on our behalf. How does that work? What does that look like? We'll look at chapter 2, verse 14. Begin there. Since therefore the children, that would be us, share in flesh and blood, he, that would be Jesus, like himself likewise, partook of the same things. Same what? Same things. What's in reference? Flesh and blood. He partook of the same flesh and blood. Not similar. Definitely not different. He took of the same flesh and blood that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it was not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham, humanity. Look at verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that, for the purpose of, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins 
of the people. Friends, the humanity of Jesus supremely matters. Because Jesus was our same flesh and blood, he was able to deliver us from the death that flesh and blood encounters. Because he was made like us in what respect? Every respect. He, was, he could propitiate for our sins. Let me ask you, how did he propitiate for your sins? Or how did he satisfy what your sins deserved? Well, what did your sins deserve? What are the wages of sin? Wages of sin are death. So how did Jesus satisfy your death that you earned by your sin? What did he do? What did he do? He died. He died. Friends, if Jesus was not human, then you don't have a sacrifice for your sin. Look again at Hebrews 2.17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Christ came to earth as God to take upon himself the flesh and blood and skin and hair of our human nature. He was human. That's a profound statement that we just kind of rattle off our tongue. God was human. God took on humanity. He was conceived in a womb. The human nature in Christ began. The human nature of Christ began. It had a beginning. Jesus entered human nature at the earliest possible point, conception. He became human in every respect. The divine being, the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, the Son, he's eternal. Jesus, the man, the human, wasn't formed ex nihilo or out of nothing. Instead, he came from God and the genetic material of Mary. He was human. He was in the line of David as was Mary. Jesus, in fact, he probably would have looked like Mary. He would have resembled his mother. Can you imagine being Joseph? People are like, huh. Anyway. The human nature of Christ came from who? His mom. He was born on a winter's night in a nowhere town, grew up human. Jesus was so human that if you grew up with Jesus... You'd be tempted to think that Jesus was merely human. That's how human Jesus was. But he wasn't merely human. He absolutely was a human, but he was more than that. That's what we see in Mark chapter 12, verse 35. Ultimately, Jesus, the Messiah, had to be human for a very specific purpose of his ministry. If he wasn't human, he couldn't die. If he didn't die, he couldn't save us. He was sent to save sinners. Friends, if you want a God who knows you and loves you still... Jesus is human. You can worship him, your divine king, the perfect God man. As Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, descendant of David. Why do the New Testament authors push the reminder that he's from David? Because being from David makes him like us in every respect. Being from David makes him the fulfillment of the promises. Being from David makes you able to relate to him. So, friend, don't forget who you're talking to. Jesus understands you because he's human. But as Jesus clarifies for the audience in verse 36, he's more than human. He is both human and divine. Notice the deity of Jesus as reason to worship our king in verse 36. David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord. So Jesus quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, uh, the most quoted psalm in all the New Testament. This was not like Jesus mining through the Old Testament, trying to find a hidden verse that nobody understood. This was like the most, this was on the bumper sticker of camels, okay? This was, everyone knew this verse. This is the foundation of Israel's hope. This is the identity of Israel's Messiah, and Jesus says about David himself uh, in the Holy Spirit, Jesus is basically what Jesus is doing is saying, hey, you like David and you like the Holy Spirit, so don't come back on me and debate the text. Look at what it says. You all love David, you all love God, so listen to what they say. The Lord said to my Lord. The Lord God said to the son of David, who is David's Lord. 
So the Messiah is David's son, comes from the lineage of David. But David calls his son essentially God. In what sense is the descendant of David his son and his Lord? It has to be that he's God. It has to be that he's man. It has to be that he's both God and man. Surely if the most exalted, most revered man in in Israel's history outside of Abraham would be David, and and David is saying that his descendant is, is worth to be calling Lord, this is putting a massive glory on, on his descendant, on the Messiah, because his descendant, because the Messiah is God. This has been out of step with the dignity afforded to someone, a patriarch like David. Why would, Davis, why would David do this? It's only because he's, he's pulling back, Jesus is pulling back just to touch the curtain to understand exactly who the Messiah is. The descendant of David who would rule in perfection, is not only a man from David, but divine. It's God. Jesus is proving to the listening crowd, even to the hateful scribes, even to the murder-hungry religious elite, that he is God incarnate. He's Lord. So if we can connect the dots, just think back a little bit. Where did you hear this title, Son of David, recently in Mark's gospel? Remember, we were leaving Jericho, and what happens? This man kind of groping along the Herodian stone walls cries out because he's blind. He says, son of David, have mercy on me. Blind Bartimaeus says, hey, the son of David can help me. And Jesus, they they meet. And what does Jesus say to him? Hey, don't call me son of David. He just says nothing of the sort. Instead, he heals him validates this man's claim. He goes on, Jesus goes on to Jerusalem. He enters Jerusalem. Hosanna, praise, hot dog. Everybody's happy. Son of David's here. The Messiah. Why are they excited? Because of what the Messiah was going to do, which was put the enemies under his feet. And so Jesus is on his triumphal entry, his parade. What do they do? Jesus takes a right, heads to the temple. The crowd wanted him to take a left and go to the governor's house and kick Rome out of Jerusalem. Jesus didn't do what they wanted. Instead, he wanted to go worship. So what did they all do? They went home. Well, he didn't kick Rome out. He must not be the true son of David. But instead, we understand here that Jesus is actually the true son of David, the God-man. Jesus says, the Lord said to my Lord. The second point of Jesus' sermon on this temple mount that Wednesday was that not only was the Messiah man, but the Messiah was also divine. Mark's been picking this bone since the beginning of his gospel. Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does it say next? The Son of God. Mark wants to make sure we understand Jesus, while fully human, is fully God. Mark 1.11, the, the fully human Jesus, in the baptismal waters, the heavens are ripped open. The dove descends down saying, this is the the suffering servant. This is the son. And God says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Just like what happened to the ultimate Boy Scout Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration when Elijah and Moses shows up and and Peter says, hey, we're going to build tents. We're going to tabernacle here for all three of them. Well, the problem with that was Moses and Elijah are nothing like Jesus. Jesus is divine. So God rips open the heaven and says, Peter, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. There's something just a little bit different about Jesus. In fact, a lot different. Jesus isn't a man. Jesus is the God man. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was with God in the beginning. How? He was eternal. He's divine. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, our hope, our, our longing for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's not just the Savior who died as a man. He's God. It's the God man. Jesus is not simply our Savior. Jesus is not simply God. Jesus is God and Savior. Jesus is human and divine. Remember Mark chapter 5, the garrison demoniac? Uh, this man was uh, animated by a legion of demons, and Jesus parks his boat on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and down comes running this man who's fully enraged with all these demons, and he flops down on his face. He lays prostrate before Jesus, and what does he say? 
What have you to do with me, son of the most high God? How come the demons can understand exactly who Jesus is as the God-man, but the people cannot? Jesus was human and divine. The Gospels in the New Testament present us with a fascinatingly robust and unapologetically unique, but a positively dogmatic view of the humanity and deity of Christ. You can't have one without the other and have life. You just can't. In theological terms, we call this the hypostatic union. Hypostasis is something that's concrete or, or sure. And what that's referring to is the two natures of Christ, the concrete divinity nature of Christ, the concrete the, the humanity, the concrete nature of Christ's humanity, and the hypostatic union saying those two things are stuck together without the ability to take them apart. There's no way that they can be mixed or blended. They're two unique things, but they're never to be separated. Why? Well, because Jesus is a person of the Godhead, the person of the one being God. We're monotheists. There's one God. There's three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in the Son, there's two natures, the divine nature and the human nature of God. Jesus can't be two persons of the Godhead, or we wouldn't have a trinity. So Jesus must be the Son of God with two natures, human and divine. Before you reach for your no-dos, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Get to Philippians chapter 2, because this, I hope and trust, will help you. I don't think Peter's influence or Mark's pen or the Spirit's desire was necessarily to teach the hypostatic union here, but it's definitely what we see in, in Mark 12. His humanity and his deity held together in the union of his twin natures. So look at Philippians chapter 2. The context, don't forget the context, is a call to humility. Okay, look at verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, verse 4, but also to the interests of others. That's the context. Paul, he gives a command. He, he gives a, a, an exhortation. What you need to do is be humble and count others as better than yourself. And Paul, like any good preacher, he's going to take what he's told you and then he's going to illustrate it or explain it or make it more clear. And in that illustration, you find who Jesus is put on display. That illustration of your humility what your humility is to look like, what you're putting the interests of others in front of yourself is to look like, the illustration is our Savior. When our Savior humbled himself and put our interests in front of his own. Look at verse 5. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So, so what's the humility that Paul's calling you to? That. Jesus' level of humility. Look at verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by being, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So what does it look like to put the interests of others in front of yourself? What's Paul calling you to do? He's saying, look, this is what it looks like. Jesus put himself on the cross for you. So these great applications of this passage often get hijacked as we look at theology, and that's what we're going to do. But look at what we learned from our Savior. Verse 5, though he was in the form of God, shorthand for though he was divine, though he was divine, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And Paul uses a fascinating word. He says he's not just hanging on to it and not letting go. He uses a word that's almost a little bit nefarious. It's kind of like uh, he, he doesn't seize it to rob it. He, he's not going to allow it to, uh, to be robbed from him or stolen from him. He, it's, it's that kind of a word. Even in some contexts, it's a form of violation. It's an aggressive word. Paul says, look, Jesus was divine, but he didn't hang on to it like that. What did he do? Instead, he just let it go through his hands like water through your open fingers. He let it be emptied. That's why this passage is called the kenosis passage. He, he let it empty out of himself. 
he emptied himself. And many people struggle with this, in part because they forget this is an illustration of Paul's form of humility that he's calling us to. There is a bit of theological murk in this water. But what is the emptying of himself? It's not, just, it's not like emptying yourself when you go to yoga and you yum, 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 or whatever you do, and you empty yourself. He, he didn't empty himself like that. He emptied himself of his divinity in the way that he put on humanity. Look at verse 7. How did he empty himself? By taking the form of a servant. The word's doulos, a bargain brand house slave. Jesus went from the glorious and divine uh, to a domestic worker who was owned by another human. Paul, he essentially drew a map of glory, and he put on the North Pole divine and the South Pole slave, and he said, look, Jesus went from here to there. He went as far as he could possibly go. He traversed the poles of honor and glory from the top to the bottom. What an act of humility. That was Paul's point. The difficulty is understanding what God, the Holy Spirit, through the pen of Paul, means when he emptied himself. Again, this, this emptying passage, it, it's to, to make void. He, he veiled his, divani- his divinity. He caused a purposefully to be veiled so that he was human in the eyes of man. Jesus, though, did not stop being God. That's where people get off track. Instead, Jesus added to God his perfect human nature. The person of Jesus kept his divine nature nature and his human nature unified the hypostatic union that stuck together let me illustrate paul's illustration with another illustration i heard a story from a missionary fascinating man it's the best story i've ever heard to illustrate the hypostatic union there's a missionary in western africa and he was dealing with a tribe of warrior people who were first-generation Christians. This is about the turn of the century between 18 and 1900. Only a few years before this missionary began to work with these people, they were entrenched in pagan idolatry and spirit and demon worship and witchcraft and sexual debauchery of every kind imaginable. They're completely and utterly godly, godless, but Christ saved them amazingly and miraculously uh, through the witness of another missionary. It was a total transformation of this village and this one uh, tribe. Their, their chief was a great man, a proud man, in part because before turning to be a Christian, the tribe was the most feared in the region. I mean, uh, he, he was an impressive man, stood head and shoulders above other people and killed many people with his javelin, which was his weapon of choice. His own people feared his power, even after he was a believer, but they always feared his wisdom and had respect for him. They treated him with reverence. His word was law. His wish was their command. He was that kind of a a guy, even after his conversion to Christ. One day there was a wedding, and this was a big deal in their, their tribe. Nobody else did weddings in their region. And the missionary and the chief were presiding over the festivities of, of this. And it was the evening of the second day of a three-day event. And they were having a feast. And they hear a shrieking cry from outside the camp. And so the women run to see what was going on. Their culture, men don't run. It's dignified. I kind of like it. But they sauntered out to where the shrieking was coming from. And they're all wearing their traditional headdresses, their war attire. They're carrying their shields and their javelins or their spears, depending on their weapon of choice. And they get to where these cries and the shriek is coming from. They knew something was amiss. They they arrived and they found that someone had fallen into the well. This young person they found to be a girl. Her torso was uh, crushed under the weight of the well. Just her head and shoulders were sticking out. And the way the well was, they couldn't get in to help her. And they recognized who she was. She was uh, from a neighboring tribe. You don't steal water in Africa. She was stealing their water from their well. And several men tried to get her out. They couldn't get a good hold of her. They probably didn't try that hard. She was a thief. She was not from their own tribe. They were ready to let her die. The chasm was such that only one man could crawl down and get a hold of her to pull her out. The missionary then described the scene as hopeless, helpless, heavy, 
girl's lungs uh, began to fill with less and less air at each breath. The weight of the dirt upon her was killing her. She was suffocating in front of all their eyes as they watched her in this muddy mess, and they could see her ashamed and broken and lost. As her breathing slowed, she appeared to give up. So there was the great chief. He slowly he took off his headdress. Uh, he took off his war necklace, which was full of lion's teeth and the scalps of men that he'd killed. He laid all of his war garb down on the ground. He, he got down, this man of great prestige, got down on the hole next to this girl. He crawled in the hole next to his enemy with his great strength. He did what no other man in the tribe could do. He pulled her nearly lifeless body out. And there she was laying on the ground, barely breathing. There was no clapping. There was no emotion other than shock. The people watched their great king set aside his stuff, his prestige to lay on the ground, to get in the mud of this woman's rightful death and to save his enemy. The people didn't see it, but the missionary saw Philippians 2. Let me ask you, did the great chief, when he took off his war bonnet and his necklace with lion's teeth and the scalps of his past enemies, did he stop being the great chief? When he pulled her nearly lifeless body from the muck, did he stop being the great chief? No, but he humbled himself. He, he did demonstrate the mind of Christ when he, began, when he became a servant to uh, his enemy. Friends, when Jesus set aside or emptied himself or veiled his divine nature and he added the nature of humanity, he didn't stop being God. When Jesus went to the cross and took our beatings and bore our shame and felt the infinite power and wrath of God upon himself, he didn't stop being divine. When Jesus died, when Jesus' eyes lost their moisture, when his brain stopped thinking, when his heart stopped beating, when his lungs stopped heaving, he didn't stop being divine. Instead, in those moments, he satisfied for all eternity the rule and the, the canon of true humility. That though possessing the nature of divinity, he willingly yielded and veiled and set aside that nature of divinity to work in the nature of humanity so that he could wade into the wasteland of our lives and rescue us. How? How? By in his humanity dying for us. The humanity and deity of Jesus are the twin truths of his being that make him both Lord and Savior. Jesus human, verse 35, and Jesus divine, verse 36, all are worthy of our worship. But there's more. Look at verse 36 again. The quotation of Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Jesus puts a question again to the crowd in verse 37. David calls himself, David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? Without understanding the dual natures of the Son of God, the Messiah, this would be impossible. That was Jesus' point. You think you know me, Jesus says, you don't know me. The one true God has a designated position for the Messiah. Where is it? At his own right hand. Sit, sit here, the Father says to the Son. God identifies the Messiah as Lord and then assigns him the place at the right hand of God, co equal with God in power, co equal with God in strength, prestige, honor, and glory. God says to the Son, Sit, it's a command. Sit here, your work is done. I got this for you. The Son of David is to sit in the position of God's power. And reign there until or as far while the Father puts the enemies of the Son under his feet. This is a picture of conquest. This is a picture of total domination. This is a picture of complete and total triumph. Well, one place we see this is in Joshua chapter 10 when God's people, Israel, are wiping out the promised land from those who saw other gods. Joshua tells the, the mighty man, he says, hey, bring, all, bring yourselves all here. I've got all the leaders of all these little tribes and places that were here before us that all need judge. Come here. They all come here, Joshua chapter 10. Joshua says, put your foot on their neck. 
they put their foot on their neck and Joshua kills them all. That's the picture that God has of the enemies of Christ. That's what God will do. Christ is untouchable. Why? Because God, the God of the universe, is for him. We know God reigns now. He, he is on a throne of power and glory and cannot be removed and cannot be thwarted. But one day his rule, instead of a rule of a patient savior king, will turn into the rule of the king who will judge. No evil will go unpunished. No good will go without reward. Jesus will judge. And only the righteous, made righteous by the work of Christ, will survive. But survive we most definitely will throughout all eternity. Do you know this, Jesus? Do you know this God-man? Does learning about him give you joy? Oh, Christian, be careful. Look at what's next. Notice the reaction of the crowd. Mark chapter 12, verse 37 here they are, hearing about the most amazing thing, about the most amazing man ever, that he's actually God. And they, instead of worshiping Christ, instead of it bringing them to their knees, the great throng heard him gladly. I love Mark's gospel. He's such a good writer. I enjoy his style. He likes to tell a good story. What's he telling you here? Is he telling you that it's good to, to enjoy good preaching? Some of you are like, well, we wouldn't know, but does he think it's good to study your Bible? It makes you glad. Oh, this last phrase kind of puts you there. It makes them glad. Why did the crowd hear Jesus gladly? Do we have any hints? We have some hints in Mark's gospel. There's only one other time he uses this phraseology. There was one other man who heard good things, who heard the gospel, who heard faith and life and repentance over and over, and he heard it gladly. Do you remember his name? It was Herod. Go back to Mark chapter 6, if you want, instead of falling on his face in repentance at the preaching of life from John the Baptist, Herod heard John the Baptist gladly. Verse 20 of Mark chapter 6, Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Herod's glad hearing of John's gospel did nothing but allow Herod to feel justified in the murder of John the Baptist. Hearing Jesus gladly is like hearing a cancer diagnosis and, and wondering immediately if you'll be able to see the Chiefs play their first game this season. What? Who cares? Do you understand what is important about life or not? If you hear Jesus gladly, you probably don't. What should you hear Jesus like? Well, friend, your soul matters. The humanity and the deity of Jesus are both designed to help you understand the links that God went to care for your soul. You can hear him gladly in this age and still hear him at the next. Say, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness, for I never knew you. How could you do that to yourself? Don't listen to him gladly, friend. Listen to him desperately as your only hope in this life filled with death. Everywhere you look, every avenue you have is a way to hell. And Jesus says, come to me. If you're weak, I'll help you. If you're burdened, I'll take it. Come to Jesus. Don't hear him gladly. Hear him desperately as the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah, and the King. Let's pray together. Father, we see our King in his greatness, in his wonder, in his majesty. And we can hear and we can learn. But Father, we need your Spirit to demand of our souls that we hear him as our true Savior, the God-man, your Lamb, and the Lion who will reign. Father, help us to hear him. In his name, amen.